Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel, and if you're new here, welcome to Tall Guy Reads. My name is Alex, and today we are going to be doing a spoiler-free review for the Prince of Nothing trilogy by R. Scott Baker. Let's do it. Alright, so diving right on into this review, the Prince of Nothing trilogy is a dark epic fantasy series written by R. Scott Baker that explores a variety of different themes and subjects such as morality, humanity, predetermined fate versus self-control, it explores free will, it explores good versus evil, and a number of other major themes and concepts related to the human condition and just, you know, life in general. It's made up of three books, which include The Darkness That Comes Before, which is book one, followed by The Warrior Prophet, and then The Thousandfold Thought. Now, The Darkness That Comes Before is the first look into this entire world that we have here from R. Scott Baker and really gives us a good idea of what we can expect this series to represent because right away you are introduced to this world that is completely reeling from an apocalyptic event that happened 2,000 years ago in the past. In all ways, shapes, and forms, this world is still feeling the repercussions of that event and in the modern day, in the present day of when the story is taking place, you have signs that another potential apocalyptic event might be you know, coming their way. In this first book, there is an announcement of a holy war by a mysterious character known as Nett, with the goal of the holy war basically to be assembling a whole bunch of people and sending them on a journey to the ancient city of Shimei, where uh, Nett and the leaders of the holy war want to free the city of Shimei from the heathens known as the Phanum. In general, R. Scott Baker weaves together a ton of different backgrounds, cultures, religions, worldviews, class rankings, and more to create a story that is so unbelievably enthralling and propulsive that I just absolutely could not put these books down when I was reading it and I just have not been able to stop thinking about the series since finishing The Thousandfold Thought a few weeks ago. And I think that's a perfect place to start with this review because for a story that's not 100% about the characters and it's not 100% about the plot itself, that's very much driven by the themes and the philosophies that are being explored throughout the books, the plot itself is very propulsive. I found myself very latched and hooked into everything that was going on. If there was a situation where I had an expectation of something I wanted to happen or something that I thought was going to happen, more often than not, it ended up being, the reality ended up being something completely different and better than anything I could have imagined. And as a result, you just get utter chaos in the best way possible, in a very calculated way that feels natural and allows the story to progress into something that feels so unique from anything else that I've read in fantasy in a long time. Each book in this trilogy has a very distinctive feel from one another, and this is something that I really enjoyed about this trilogy. The first book, The Darkness Comes Before, is very much your first introduction to the world, to the characters and everything that is going on within you know this announcement of the holy war and all the other situations surrounding it one thing i have to say about r scott baker and the darkness comes before is just how quickly he got me invested in this world i think whenever i start an epic fantasy series the first book sometimes can be a little bit jarring because i'm trying to just find my footing when it comes to the names when it comes to the world and it takes me a little bit to really get invested in what I think is going to happen or what I want to happen with the characters on the page. And R. Scott Baker, it took me very little time. I think within 150, 200 pages of this book, I was deeply invested in all the political movements of what, how these characters were reacting to this announcement of the Holy War and how they were trying to extract it and use it for their own personal gain. And it was just fascinating. Book two, The Warrior Prophet, kind of takes a step away from this political intrigue. And it's not that it's gone entirely. I definitely think it's still there. I just found that for the most part, this book really focused on the character work and the character narrative of all the major characters in this story. And I love this book for that reason. I'm definitely a character driven reader. And I found the Warrior Prophet to be an excellent example of how R. Scott Baker does writes characters so well and he takes everything that was established in book one and all the different parties of all these different groups of people and starts he starts twisting them and starts taking these characters and starts pitting them against each other pinning them for each other kind of you know establishing love relationships and making really complicating them and there's just a lot of character work that is done in this book that is just excellent in addition to that the warrior prophet also has some of the highest highest highs when it comes to the action of the trilogy and this is the first time that you really see how R. Scott Baker writes massive action scenes, and it is really good. I was very impressed by how he was able to write some of the battle scenes that are in The Warrior Prophet especially, and it was just a lot of fun watching that develop from the first book to the second book. And all of that caps off with book three, which is A Thousandfold Thought, which kind of takes 
a, a new turn in addition to everything that has been established in book one and book two to provide a way more philosophical look at everything that is going on. This book is way is filled way more with ideas and philosophies in the sense that it's more upfront in your face as a reader. You're getting much more philosophical look at every the reality of the situation that's on the ground and kind of what is motivating these characters to do certain things that they're doing. And it is absolutely fascinating. It's sometimes it can get a little bit too heady, but I think that on a reread, especially I'm going to be able to pick up on way more than I did on this first read, but I still really enjoyed it. And I thought it offered a very unique look that I hadn't really gotten to that, that fullest extent in the trilogy so far. That being said, there are definitely some huge character moments in this last book. There's a lot of action. There's a lot of political intrigue. So they kind of build on each other, but they still, at the end of the day, all three books very, have a very distinct feel about them. And that's one thing that I really enjoy about this series. While there are many things I absolutely loved about this trilogy i think my favorite part about these three books are the characters and this is very interesting because i didn't actually expect to love the characters going into it this was a story i was had heard it was way more you know idea heavy this is a, a very philosophical series so i expected to enjoy the characters but i didn't expect them to be as play as big of a role in my enjoyment as i ended up doing but i have not been able to stop thinking about these characters since finishing these books the prince of nothing trilogy is huge when it comes to the school scope of the series when it comes to everything that R. Scott Baker was trying to cram in here in order to make this book and this trilogy as expansive as possible. But the one thing that he really doesn't let go of are the character moments. And I think there are a number of small, very personal, very you know, intimate character moments between two or three characters at multiple times throughout the series that worked so well for me. And I loved seeing that because while I love the massive scope and I love fast paced plotted stories and I love, you know, deeply thematic stories, I am a character driven reader day in and day out. And I loved seeing that focus on the characters throughout these books in addition to everything else that he was, you know, putting into this story. One thing that R. Scott Baker does so well is introduce you to a character, make you want to root for them. You get charmed by them. You find yourself invested in them. You find yourself extremely curious about them, if nothing else. And very quickly after that, establishing some feelings that, you know, yeah, you like this person. Very quickly after that, he will flip it so hard. They will do something so horrendous that you start challenging everything that you had guessed up to that point. And there, as a result, there are multiple characters in the story that you will constantly change your feelings on, that I constantly change my feelings on as I made my way through this trilogy. That being said, despite all of the darkness that is explored through the characters in this book, there are also some really, just really touching moments. I think two of the characters within the story actually have a love relationship that is probably one of the most impactful love connections, relationships that I've read in fantasy in a long time. I think despite the fact that it is dysfunctional on multiple levels, there are some crazy things that happen within these two characters and outside of these two characters in regards to this relationship. I think on a general level, this is a devastating, it is a very emotional charged relationships that had me really hooked in and really impacted me on a variety of levels as I was watching this, you know, kind of relationship between these two characters progress throughout this trilogy. So I'm not going to dive into all the different characters within this trilogy because I do think that would take quite a bit of time, but I do want to briefly touch on two of my favorite characters within the series. And the first one has to be a Nasser Rimbor or Anna Rimbor Kellis. Now, Kellis is one of the most mysterious individuals I've read about, and I want nothing more than to learn everything I possibly can about this character. Anasarim Borkelis is a monk that is sent from his order, the Dunyane, in order to search for his father, Anasarim Borkelis, and as a result, he becomes a central figure in the story being told, and as a result, the central one of the central figures in this holy war in general. Kellis is so mysterious. He's so intriguing. And the first moment you are, you are introduced to him, you just want to know more. And I think this is a perfect example of a character that the second that you learn something about them, you have 10 more questions to ask. Kellis has an ability to basically read someone's thoughts and every intentions based on the facial patterns, the muscle patterns on their face. And this is something that is so interesting to me. Kellis's ability to do this and how he uses it throughout the story really you know, challenges you on what you think about this character. Kellis is one of the major characters that I constantly was flipping back and forth on in terms of where I landed on him, whether I liked him, whether I didn't like him, if he was, if I really hated him, if I didn't trust him at all, or if he was the character I wanted to succeed the most. It was just such a constant volatile fluctuation that kept me so engaged. And as a result, he ended up being one of my favorite characters of the story because he was just so 
uh, mysterious and I just absolutely wanted nothing more than to learn more about his character. The other character that I loved so much was a character named Drusus Akamian who is a sorcerer sent from the school of the mandate which is basically one of the schools of sorcery within this world and within this world there are a variety of different schools of sorcery and the world itself kind of looked down on sorcery in all shapes and forms and at the same time there are a variety of different schools of sorceries that kind of are not on good agreements with each other. And one of those schools is the school of the mandate. And that's where Juice's Akami and hails from. And his his order sends him out to basically learn more about Maithanet and the Holy War. And as a result, he finds himself completely wrapped up in the events of the Holy War and everything else that is to come. But he is a very interesting character. And I found his actual, uh, his journey throughout these three books to say it without any spoilers, to be one of my favorites. I think his, his character, ups and downs throughout the series are fantastic. I think what he goes through is very, you know, there's a lot of challenging situations that involve Drusus Akamian. And I think how he, where he ends up at the end of the series is very fascinating. And looking back on where he was at the beginning of the first book, it's just, it's something that I just really enjoyed exploring along the way. As I said, Drusus Akamian is a sorcerer of the school of the mandate. And one thing that separates the mandate from all the other schools of sorcery is the fact that they are waiting for a second apocalypse essentially. Ever since the original apocalypse, the one 2,000 years ago in the past, Akamian and all the other people that are part of the school of the mandate dream the events, the harrowing, terrible events of the first apocalypse in their dreams every single night on a level that is so impactful to their psyche and to their everyday personality that the experiencing this every single night sets them on one goal in order to prevent the second apocalypse and what they believe is coming no matter what. And a lot of other people in this world think that they're a joke, think that they are spouting nonsense, they don't want to listen to them. But a character like Drusus Akamian coming in and being sent to, you know, search for Mate the Net and be a part essentially join up with this holy war and all the other characters that we have in the story provides for a very interesting combination and you start to see how maybe there's a bigger picture going on here than what is originally assumed from a lot of the characters at the start of the darkness that comes before in addition to those characters you also have esminette or esme who is a prostitute whose love for a certain character takes her to completely unexpected places you have surway who is a slave girl who becomes a major catalyst in terms of you know how she affects a variety of other characters around her and her role to play within the story overall. You also have Nauru, which is the chief of the Utmat, which is a Sklavendi tribe of nomadic, war-driven tribal men who kind of roam the world of Irwa. And he is basically a brutal person who is trying to do whatever he can to, uh, to gain revenge on the death of his father, which occurred 30 years prior to the start of this book. On top of that, you have Akuri Zirius, who's the emperor of Nansur, as well as his nephew, Akuri Confis, who play major roles in this story. And I think overall, you just watch how uh, R. Scott Baker is able to essentially, in my opinion, masterfully tie all these characters together from all these different variety of cultures and backgrounds and make them basically converge together on a variety of different levels, whether it's physically, whether it is on a spiritual level, whether it's on a thematic level in the story being told, in some way, shape, or form, he brings them all together in a way that makes so much sense. It feels, it ties everything together. And one thing that I love that he does with all these characters is that these characters are making certain decisions that have huge impacts on them and have dramatic changes and dramatic impact on the relationships that they hold with certain characters throughout the story. And it just results in a lot of change. It results in a lot of change in the characters on an individual level. It results in a lot of growth between you know who these characters are friendly with and not friendly with and also how these characters may use each other to order in order to achieve certain goals or certain intentions that they are trying to pursue and i just think overall the character work in the prince of nothing trilogy was phenomenal it was not what i expected to love the most going into the trilogy but at walking away from it it's my favorite part about these first three books i just absolutely loved it and i have not been able to stop thinking about a variety of these characters since finishing the book three a few weeks ago. I think another aspect of the story that R. Scott Baker does very well is the world building. And I think in addition to kind of what I was talking about when it came to Drews as a comment and the schools of the sorcery, the entire contrast between magic users and sorcerers and just people that don't aren't practicing sorcery in this world is so interesting and it feels very different from a lot of fantasy I've read where you know magic is usually and magic users are very high, hold to a high esteem and they're very revered in certain ways here they're feared and a lot of people that don't practice sorcery don't want anything to do 
with sorcerers. And so as a result, they kind of are outcasts on the society in this world. And it provides a very interesting contrast to a lot of other fantasy that I've read. In addition to that, there are a ton of political facts in this world. I mean, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of different countries, different groups of people, different groups of that have very specific goals in mind. And it's very interesting to watch how all these different groups of people use each other or you know use against each other to kind of pursue what they are trying to achieve in this overall grand scheme i have to say i think my biggest con when it comes to this series in general these three books is the fact that especially on a first read it can be overwhelming at times there are certain times where r scott baker definitely just throws names at you and will throw lots of names and lots of groups of people's names and so i definitely found myself a variety of times trying to flip back to whatever glossary was present in the book i was reading and i used the glossary more than I have in a lot of fantasy recently and it's just something that was a part of my reading experience much more actively in these two books it definitely made me feel made me feel really engaged within the story but there definitely were times in the warrior prophet and the thousandfold thought especially where I felt like it got to a point where I was kind of like you know what as long as I kind of had the general idea of wh who these these certain groups are fighting for I'll be okay and I kind of stopped putting in as much effort as I probably was at the very start figuring out who exactly each group of people was despite that point though I will say I think overall R. Scott Baker's writing style is a huge plus for me in this series similar to what I experienced when I was reading Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson I went into this series kind of expecting this the prose to be very dense I think because I've heard heard how thematically heavy and thematically rich this trilogy is and how dark some of the subject matter is and just how dense some of the plot beats can be. I expected the prose to be kind of in the same way and despite being all the good things I'd heard about his writing style, I'd expected it to be just a little bit more cumbersome to get through and it ended up being so readable. I think it's some of the most readable prose I've read in quite a while and it's actually extremely impressive how readable it was for what he was able to convey along the way when it came to the big ideas and everything else that he was exploring in these books. I just really had a great time reading his writing style. It was very fluid. It made me just kind of zone out and, and focus on the story. It was very majestic and poetic. I think I highlighted more in these three books on my Kindle than I have for a lot of books recently. And it's just poured through highlights because every other page I was just like wow that is such a good line would highlight it and I just really enjoyed doing that. He has a writing style that fits thematically with everything else that is going on in this story and it really adds that philosophical nature to it while at the same time veering very easy to follow for the plot and the story and just the actual you know personal character moments that are happening on the page. With that said the final big thing I want to talk about is kind of the atmosphere and the tone and the subject matter of these books. So this series is dark and I think one of the biggest things about it that really makes it so dark is just the actual tone in and of itself from the beginning you will realize that this world is bleak there is a lot of bleakness there's come some borderline nihilism at times that you will feel throughout the story there's a lot of sense of hopelessness and dread that gets built very effectively by baker along the way and the opening book starts off with a quote by nietzsche and it's just a fantastic quote but it really sets a tone for the story you really know what you're in for right from the beginning baker explores a lot of ideologies and themes and things like metaphysics in these books and to the point that it's something that becomes a very integral part to the series and the atmosphere of this story overall and I really enjoyed it I definitely didn't pick up on a lot of it and I think most readers won't especially on your first time through I think on a reread and on a few rereads I will definitely pick up on more when it comes to the ideologies that are being kind of expressed through the characters in this in these books and I think that this is a type of story that you could absolutely dissect you know one single paragraph and get a ton out of it i think there's so much packed in you here when it comes to theme and ideology and what baker's trying to express that being said baker using this world and the story he has written to explore certain ideas is something that's a very big part of the story and it doesn't necessarily equate to him believing every single thing he's putting on the page but that being said there are definitely moments of this series that you will feel like he is definitely you know expressing his views on certain things especially when it comes to his worldview and just view on the human condition and it's something that you just definitely should be aware of. I know some readers who are really hate when authors do that. Um, I don't. I found it to be really 
interesting and I really enjoyed it and I thought it really fit with the overall story but I definitely wanted to make it make you aware of that because it absolutely plays a role in this in these three books especially in the third book The Thousand Fold Thought. Now with all of that said should you read The Prince of Nothing trilogy by R. Scott Baker? Now before I can give you a straight yes or no answer I can't really review this series without bringing up the fact of just how dark this series is and this is something I touched on earlier but I think it's very important it's not something I can really gloss over because this is probably the darkest fantasy series I've ever read. And that's no exaggeration. I just haven't read a ton of super dark fantasy, and especially ones that hit on the level that this hit. I just think the subject matter in these three books is, you know, very it's extreme at times. And I think R. Scott Baker really pushes the limit when it comes to a lot of the character situations, a lot of the themes that are going on, a lot of the actions that take place with some of the characters and just the overall worldview. There's a lot of trigger warnings. There's sexual assault. There's assault in general. There's violence. There's a lot of ni borderline nihilistic nihilism at times there's just a lot of dark worldview and a lot of you know despicable acts that happen within these three books and he really doesn't shy away from it and I just want to make this point clear because if you are interested in the series and you know you are not comfortable with those types of things I probably would recommend you not pick up this series because no matter what I say I promise you like there are absolutely these things in the series and they are not going anywhere so if this is something that you know bothers you if this is something you really don't want to read about just be aware that it is very present in the story. With that said, on my end, I found it to work very well in the overall story. I think Baker does a very good job of tying everything together when it comes to the overall tone and atmosphere of the story and making it so all of these, you know, despicable acts that these characters are committing throughout the story have huge repercussions on them as individuals, but also the situation around them. And I think he absolutely shows that at a very human level throughout the series. And as a result, Sometimes, you know, these really dark moments really result in me as a reader getting a lot more emotion out of, out of me than other less dark situations might. And I think that's exactly what happened here. I just think I found myself extremely invested in these characters, extremely invested in the story, much quicker than I usually am. And there's just things from the story that I just will never, ever forget. On that note, if you're okay with that, if you're comfortable with taking a look at the absolute depravity of humanity at its lowest point, and you're also looking for an epic, dark epic fantasy story with some rich political intrigue with some wonderful world building with some fantastic characters with the just awesome action scenes some extremely epic highs and lows and some very interesting and thought-provoking ideologies and philosophies that are intricately woven throughout the narrative of the story look no further because the prince of nothing trilogy will have all of that and so much more overall the prince of nothing trilogy by r scott baker was an absolute hit for me. I loved all three of these books and I'm so excited to see what's to come in the sequel series, the Aspect Emperor series, because I genuinely don't know where the story is going to go from here. The Prince of Nothing was one of the most unique and rewarding reading experiences I've had in a long time and I just really, really, really got so much out of this story. Overall, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed this content. If you do, please think about subscribing, hitting that bell notification down below if you want to get updates of new videos as they come out. Hitting that like button helps me out, helps the channel out a lot, and I really, really appreciate it. But with all that said, I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Mm.